Wow, as entrepreneurs, we want to make a difference. We want to work in areas that we're really passionate about. Well, I have someone today who is a remarkable entrepreneur. Not only is he a phenomenal entrepreneur, but he's a phenomenal entrepreneur in two areas that most of us, most guys and many, many gals love. Racing cars and fine wine. And he puts them together in an amazing way, but he didn't start there. And I've asked him to share with us today some lessons learned from where he got started to where he is today, because it's amazing. You do not want to miss this remarkable entrepreneurs and the lessons that will be learned. Ordinary success? No way. You want amazing, remarkable, exceptional breakthroughs. Dig deep, think bold, drive hard. Watch yourself soar beyond your dreams. AESNation.com Kevin, I am so excited to have you here. I mean, you are an, uh, an amazing entrepreneur. I have so many friends that have tried to do what you've done, and you have blown it out. So thank you for making time for us today. Thank you, John. It's an honor to be on and uh, really eager to be able to, you know, share some of our challenges and lessons and be part of your world. Uh, and, and we've got so many entrepreneurs that want to learn. And, and you know, we, what we really want to do is build great businesses that support a high quality of life. And you and I met at kind of an event that was a high quality of life that you specialize in. I, I went with one of the magazine, car magazines, Auto Week, and I was up in Sonoma and we had a chance to act as one of their kind of uh, advisors. There's 20 of us readers, avid readers, that were invited up to test drive cars and so on. It was a great experience. And one of the highlights was coming over to your company, uh, TRG, the racing group, to have dinner. And, you know, I thought, well, geez, is a racing team in Sonoma. And not only did you have a racing team, but you had a winery. We all had a fantastic event. You had some of the best looking race cars that I've ever seen in my life. And then I got to check to see how well they've done. And, and you know, Kevin, there, there's so many lessons. I had the opportunity to sit next to you at dinner. And I mean, just so many things you were able to share with the group and that I had a chance to talk with you about it. And, and I, that's why I wanted to have you on here. But you know what, before we get in there, give us a little of the backstory, that journey, because, you know, normally I'll start out and say, well, at five, you know, you didn't wake up and say you wanted to drive race cars, but maybe you did. <laughs> yeah, it's funny, but thanks, John. The, indeed, uh, you know, I think like a lot of people, we started chasing, uh, chasing a dream and uh, found about halfway through there. Maybe it wasn't the dream that I wanted. I was uh, working very hard in a real estate development company that I started, and it grew very fast, and we were successful, but I, I just wasn't happy. And about the same time I was really realizing this, I lost, sort of tragically lost a dear friend and my mom at the same time. So it was just a little bit of a, you know, a real wake up call. And I said, do I want to be in this exact same position in 10 years? If I'm not happy, I have it. I, I can change it. I'm the only one that can change it. Crying on the couch is not an option. So, uh, and I use that a lot with my kids, but, um, the, uh, you know, I decided that, you know, if I ever work this hard again and I want to do it with something I love and around people I like. And uh, so the two things that I really cared about were motorsports, racing, uh, and also uh, wine. You know, I grew up in Southern California as a Southern California car culture kid. And I was a jock and played tennis and surfed and did all sorts of fun stuff, I guess. But, you know, the, the one thing is when those two things struck and I was going to strike out on my own with this business, uh, we sold the company and were able to move back to California in the early 90s, and uh, I chased it. And it took 25 years. You know, I, my old uh, my joke about it takes uh, 25 years to be an overnight sensation. Well, it, it sure has kind of been that way, both with the race team and a little bit with the winery. But it is, you know, I mean, you go to your place, Kevin, and it, and it's pretty spectacular at, at TRG, the racing group, and you know, to see. I don't know how many cars you here had in that night, but I mean. You know, you're, you know, all of us know the car, recognize it right away, you know, from James Bond movie, Aston Martin. We can see, you know, if you're watching it on video and definitely you're going to want it. If you're listening to this on the podcast, you're going to want uh, to go to uh, asnation.com to get all the links to see all the things we're going to talk about. Because, 
uh, motor sports are definitely a visual. <laughs> Sound is good, but you know, but the cars were just amazing. And and you know, I was kind of surprised. I'm a guy who follows uh, you know racing a bit. I'm not you know a diehard fan, but I I love it and I I make time to do it each year to go out to some of the big events and so on. And and I always thought these were all company teams and to see you know I mean what are these cars doing here at this place type thing how, sure. how did that evolve yeah you know a lot of times uh you know sport ra sports car racing first of all is what we specialize in which is recognizable cars they look like a BMW or a McLaren or a Ferrari or a Porsche in our case now an Aston Martin so we run the Aston Martin racing division for North America and a lot of the other tasks and and assignments that are associated with that we we buy and race our own cars here in the US uh, we, we do that for clients as well, who we supply all the technology and the infrastructure for them to go racing. And we also support other teams, teams that buy these cars and want to live, they live in Chicago or New York and they need a little technical support from us. But what's really happened is, you know, we're in a magic moment right now. It's what I like to say in time with sports car racing. It's always nice if once in a while you happen to be in the right place at the right time. Uh, it wasn't, in this case, it wasn't lucky. We just worked really hard. And finally, you know, looking through the fence for years at NASCAR or IndyCar, you know, sports car racing has become relevant. There's a lot of manufacturer support. So you see a lot of money coming into the sport from the big manufacturers. And also it's popular. A lot of fans, a lot of people. Our brand is popular. And so what's been happening with us the last couple of years, we've been doing a ton, like with you, a ton of really cool entertainment, relationship marketing, corporate hospitality events. And I, I'm 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 honored. I'm happy. I'm also giggling a little bit because, you know, watching us sort of steal away some of the business from, say, golf or tennis or stick and ball sports and do it around something that people so much love to be involved in, you know, a day of driving at the racetrack, followed by sort of a cool, epic wine dinner. And like you said, people come to our facility and they're like, what the heck? We're going to a race shop for dinner? And they walk in and they're like, wait a minute, this is cool. It's quite different. And I mean, most of all of your viewers and listeners and the entrepreneurs out there, everyone can probably choose to do, you know, go dine anywhere they want. So we try to offer a very unique experience if we do it here. And if we're not doing it here, we're doing it on the road. We try to do the same type of thing in, in a setting that'll be memorable. And, you know, the one thing, and I know it's a big part with you guys too, is we always try to over deliver. And, and you did that night. And, and it's one of the reasons why I wanted to reach out to you because, you know, I, I thought, okay, I'm in Sonoma. You know, this is Napa, Sonoma for everybody that's not real familiar. If you ever drank wine, the chances are it came from one of these two premier areas. And so we're going to, you know, a, uh, you know, a race car shop <laughs> type thing. And I haven't gone to too many of those. But uh, in Sonoma, there, I don't think you've got a lot of uh, competition there probably. No. And then... You know, and then we're having dinner and it was a great event. Everybody enjoyed really seeing all the cars and so on. And then you bring out the wine and I'm used to going out to a lot of events. I put on a lot of events and you and I, and I want to make sure we get to this, but you know, for entertaining the, the opportunity for connections. I mean, the connections I walked out of the dinner, you know, there, and I was just a guest were just unbelievably uh, powerful. And, and certainly for auto week, it was, you know, it was a home run. I was talking with the publisher and sitting at our table too, Kevin, he just told me, you know, it was amazing. And, and you poured some great wine. I mean, as a matter of fact, I had to kind of wrestle some of your best wine away from you. You had 15 wines, I think, uh, over 90 on a wine spectator. I mean, and these were phenomenal wines. So it was just an unbelievable evening. Yeah, so the, the fun part is that, you know, it's imperative to us that both businesses are operating at a high level. It would be a shame to have one of them be successful and try to work with the other one and have to prop it up or make apologies. It's also really important to me. I mean, we're, we're, we're big guys in the racing world. We're little guys in the wine world. But I'm really proud of our small brand. And when I stand up in front of a group here at a Ritz-Carlton in Florida or at a big event in New York, and I'm the one tapping the glass and telling the stories, I, I, I'm genuine, man. I want to make sure I'm telling the story correctly and that I believe in what we're doing. Super important to me. So the wines have to deliver. Or people are going to call you know, BS. And they're going to say, yeah, great. It wasn't that good. And so what I like too, it's a little bit of a kick is a lot of times people will take a sip, listen to what you're saying. And, and they'll, they'll say like, 
wow, you know, that's really good. And what I always laugh about, they're kind of saying, I didn't really expect that. I thought you're the racer guy. So uh, we, we work equally hard on both businesses. But in the end of the day, you know, we're kind of the big guys in the racing world and we're little guys in the wine world. And again, I'm proud of our small boutique brand. Well, and, and let's go to that, Kevin. I, I mentioned, I mean, you've, you really have gotten an awful lot of acknowledgments on the wine side, but there's no shortages of wins and you know successes on the racing side too. And that's one of the reasons why you've been able to build this you know, a great company. I mean, why don't you share with, you know, some of that as well, and then we'll go into the lessons learned. Sure. You know, when we started racing in the early 90s, uh, you know, I was our test dummy. We were, we were a parts company making competition parts, and I was basically specking everything and building it and checking it out on my own cars or any of my poor friends I try to try it out on. And uh, it, it hit pretty quick. We had a lot of really good ideas on engineering services and our company grew. We were at this point sort of describing what we do. We were a multifaceted motorsports operation at that time centering mostly around Porsche. So we were parts we were service. Someone might give us their car and say, work on my car. We'd build a car. And then we started a lot of what today has turned into our a lot of our entertainment side is we did a lot of arrive and drive services. So somebody would say, hey, I want to race with you guys in Sebring, Florida or Watkins Glen, New York, but I'm not going to drive all the way back there. You know, I'm too busy. So we put all the cars on the trailer and load them up and take them back there and have a great weekend with these guys. And again, that kind of grew. I was our professional driver for a long time and uh, seven years of, you know, learning in the beginning, building our brand after we'd finally moved up here to the racetrack area. We were at Sonoma Raceway for since 90, from 95. We were in Monterey for three years and at 95 to 2004, we we're at the racetrack. In 2002, I had a, a big break where we finally had attracted the attention of a corporate sponsor and my good friend over at Monster Cable and he backed us to go down to the 24 hours of Daytona which is a big race for us it's and and we were still a little team little independent team and along the short of it we put together a, a good program a good formula that I still follow to this day and we won and uh, later that year I was accepted to run finally at the 24 hours of Le Mans I'd been bonked on the nose many times because we were a small again independent team no real family, uh, you know, embassy history or with the factory. And, and we got accepted to Le Mans and did the unthinkable. We went over there and, and beat the Porsche factory and ended up winning the race. And it was a, you know, epic moment for me and the team. Had a really great finish to the season and then came back the following year and did it again at Daytona. This time was a Super Bowl ring for us because we ended up winning the race overall but we won it from the GT class, which has never been done, and sort of formulating some of my different little life lessons that I try to follow, you know, and uh, and I had a great couple years, and then in 2004, um, you know, we were very busy with corporate involvement, sponsorship, and things, and I sort of, again, it was that same moment from back in 92, I said, you know, I think I have to change my own personal strategy within the scope of what I'm doing. I can continue driving this car, but I think we're going to do better if I get out. Um, I'm probably more valuable steering the ship than driving the car. Cause there's a bunch of young folks that can do that every bit as good as I was doing it. So no, it was a big it, moment at that point. Well, and it's a big deal. And it's one, I mean, it's one of the lessons that all of us learn as entrepreneurs at some point. And, you know, we, we've got to you know, bring, you know, the, really a team around us and, and really decide what is our unique ability. And, you know, no question, you're a phenomenal driver. But you're also, you know, a great CEO, rainmaker, and connecting people, and and you know there uh, there there aren't that many good of each. But you you found you know kind of the the biggest value you could do, and, and I think as entrepreneurs we all need to do this is to kind of take a step back, you know, at least once a year, and kind of are we you know where we should be for what we want to accomplish over sure. our lifetime, and boy, what a difference. But you know. It, Talk about, you know, building a team, Kevin, because, you know, I mean, you've built a couple teams. I mean, it's pretty, I mean, the races you've won, you know, it's just, you know, I, 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 you've shared some of them with us over dinner. I've read your background and preparation for this. And I just, it's like, you know, as a matter of fact, I was walking down to the studio and, you know, my wife asked, well, who are you going to interview? And I said, I got really one of my favorite interviews I'm ever going to do because, I mean, you've just, you know, you've, you've done it as a driver and then, I think most people who aren't into, uh, you know, racing don't know, you know, having a small independent team, uh, that's a hard thing to do that, you know, the, the be Absolutely. seriously competitive in the number of events that you have. I mean, there's certainly a lot of independent teams that come in and go out very quickly, but you, your staying <laughs> power has been amazing. And it, it, you've surrounded yourself with talent. How, how did you build these teams? 
Yeah, so the team approach actually was a decision. And one of my things I always say, you know, think strategic. And the big part when we started, and I realized, look, we've got a chance at this, but we're sort of outgunned. I mean, we were started, when we started originally, we were definitely looked at as a, a dragon slayer. And, you know, you can only do that so many times. And so, but unfortunately, or fortunately, both businesses I'm involved in are dominated at the top with big money, big factories, you know, wealthy guys. And, you know, what, how do you take them down? And I think one of the ways we did it was surround myself with really great people that are motivated, know we have a little bit of an under, underdog story, work really, really hard at what we do. And, uh, you know, while they're taking their eye off the ball, we're not. And, uh, you know, I don't do a lot of other things. I'm really focused on motorsports, you know, 24-7. And a lot of guys get into the business thinking it's cool. And, uh, you know, we, we see them, they see the exit quickly with, um, you know, a big hole in their checkbook. And, uh, you know, I like it when they come, but I, I don't want them to know it's not easy. So. Yeah, no, it's it, it definitely is not easy. It takes, uh, you know, uh, I mean, really both, you said it earlier, the, uh, you know, the best way to be successful in motorsports and wine and make some money, you know, little money at least, is start with big money. And uh, having been a financial advisor most of my life to an awful lot of ultra-affluent people, I can vouch for that. I have seen, you Absolutely. know, there's other activities, boats, horses, and so on that, that continues. So it's, it's really a rare treat to find an entrepreneur that's making this work. And there's some really good lessons, I think, because, Kevin, what you do so well is you're, you're big on experiences because it's not just winning the race. I mean, it's bringing not only the team and, you know, having the whole team to support, but it's all the, you know, whether it's sponsors, whether it's, you know, uh, individuals, corporations that are involved with you and using that you know, for connections. And uh, one of the things I love, and I want to go to network in a second, but I want to, what's so important is to create a great experience. Sure. And you pride yourself on always over delivering. And you know, I've asked some people who've worked with you. I was at the one event. I know you do that. You know, how did you get, you know, get to that point? And then what does that really mean to you? Well, as part of the same strategy we were just talking about is keeping the, you know, how are we going to, how are we going to win at what we do when sometimes from the outside looking in, the odds are definitely not in your favor. And one of those things is to, is to over deliver, you know, in racing and a lot of these glamorous sports, or if you're involved in, again, horses or boats, there's a lot of people that come in and dabble, but, um, you know, maybe the, the clients aren't getting what they expected or the team's not delivering. And so when we actually are in a sport, that can be sometimes rampant with that, and we always deliver on a great experience, the reputation goes quickly. And so there's a lot of networking within our business. There's a lot of word of mouth. You know, I'm very proud of what we've assembled, and, you know, I can get my, my phone call generally answered anywhere in the racing community, up, up one side and down the other. But, you know, it's been a long haul doing that. And uh, right what you said, over-delivering on your promises and your experiences. And then when the guests, when they come, again, our guests are people that could do anything. They could choose to be anywhere. We just took a whole group of people over to Le Mans, France, as part of the Aston Martin Motorsports Festival. The, the uh, Aston Martin was the honored mark this year, and they ran before the 24-hour race. So we were running in a shorter race, sort of a support race. But all week, we were at a 17th century chateau. We had the chefs. We had the little mini buses running back and forth. And this was a bucket list experience for these 25 people that came and eight of them were driving. And, uh, you know, I left there absolutely worn out, but super, super happy because everybody left with a smile on their face. And that was super important to my wife yeah, and I. Yeah, I know. And, it's, and sometimes people don't recognize how exhausting it is making that over delivery, but I know you do. And and that that is so powerful. And I mean, this is one of the things that really comes, I'm gonna go to our third point is building a network. You know, in today's world, you know, particularly once you become affluent to, you know, ultra affluent, the way we define it in our research is a million or more financial assets, you start becoming affluent. Ultra affluent is 25 million and above. You know, there's just the, there are 5 million homes that are affluent or above in the U.S. And, and, you know, at that point, you really have most of the material things. You may not have your own jet or your own race car, but you got a, you got a pretty much a pretty good life. You're looking to collect not more things, but experiences. And, you know, tell, tell us, you know, you built an unbelievable network by, you know, creating the team and over delivering. And how does this all come together? Sure. Um, you know, it's funny when we first started, I don't think that the network 
was as clear on my goal as just getting things going. But it came within short order, especially 10 years ago, where I was realizing the power of the networks. People wanted to be in our world, and when they come, I think the number one thing I wanted to see is they come back or they tell their friends. It's real easy to take you know, a one-hit wonder at any other number of events. It's, it's a hassle. I give my, uh, I give my staff a... You know, a little speech. I said, you know, a lot of these people who come here, you'd be lucky to get five minutes in their office, but they just gave you three days on the weekend. Make sure it counts. Make sure it's perfect. Make sure that they're happy. And so, you know, the power of the network in so many ways, one of the things I think is super important is you have to deliver because if it's a one way street and you're sucking off people, you know, in a way that you're not really delivering an experience for them, then it's not good. But then once you maybe reach out to someone else and say, hey, can you help me with or do you have an idea or can we share some stuff? And it's an easy conversation. I love that. I'm very proud of the network, my friends that we've assembled within the, a variety of industries. And I lean on those guys sometimes for advice, and they lean on me. And But we do share a lot of cool experiences. And I love it when my phone rings. Today, my phone's ringing on a couple of people that are sending some friends out from you know, a beautiful resort in Florida, and they know that we're going to deliver a great experience. It was his word to his friend, and his CEO is coming, so they're going to stop by the shop next week, and we're going to give him a tour. And he's trusting me, and I want to deliver on that trust. No, this is so powerful. I, I learned this, Kevin, uh, early on in my financial services career. I was in London with a, a company that I was doing uh, work with, and the CEO uh, spent $500,000 creating, you know, bringing over all their top clients and, and really creating this special event. And I remember asking him, I go, you know, David, this is, um, you know, does it make any sense spending this amount of money? You know, and I was pretty young at the time. And he, he goes, John, to spend four days with my top clients, this will be paid back next week. Absolutely. Well, and David's a multiple billionaire now. <laughs> he understood experiences much earlier than I did. Sure. And I'm I'm creating those too. And 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 it's it's that you know for all of us. I mean, I, I you know, certainly you can get a, on a phone. You know, you and I uh, certainly get most people we want on a phone and have a conversation. But to spend a day at a racetrack or some other experience. You know, that, that connections that come out of that, it's just, you know, it's a totally different experience. I think sometimes, too, I have to make sure I check myself. This might be one of the, you know, mini lessons is make sure to keep those net, that network alive. Like when I travel, a lot of times I'll look back into the area I go and I'll see who have I not seen lately or what have I not done. And, you know, I might owe someone a phone call. It's like reconnecting with an old friend. And although life gets in the way, your emails get in the way, stuff gets in the way, it's worth it to keep that network alive and to continue to deliver, you know, friendly you know, exchanges and experience. You know, I've, I have three awesome daughters, and one of them's away in college at Washington, D.C., and, you know, when we first went back there, I was just trying to connect with some of my friends, and it's nice to see how they start to understand, wow, you know, having a network at a young age is important because I, I wasn't thinking that when I was 17, 18, 19 years old. You know, you weren't thinking about that at all, but it's important to build it early on well, today. And, and, and you do, I mean, you, you, you're a big giver. You know, that's the experiences. You're helping other people, but also then you're providing these really really valuable connections. One of the things that I love though, what you shared with me that you do is you, how you end every day by asking yourself whether you did an excellent job today. And, and I, I, and I can see that show in the results, but yeah, you know, where did that develop? You know, it's, it, I don't know where it developed. It was just something that, you know, after a long day, a lot of times for me, it might be a day at the shop or a day at the racetrack. We're on the road. I'm probably on the road 25, major events per year and it's unfortunately I have a very patient understanding uh my wife Deborah and our CFO of the company here to understand I have to do that but um it'll be um it'll be all day at the track it'll be uh back home to the back home to the hotel clean up pop a red bull and head out to an event for not for a night event and uh you know I'd come back and say did I do an excellent job I hope the answer is yes it's not always but if I didn't, if I did an excellent job and I feel good, I swear, first of all, I sleep better. And secondly, you know, try to learn and try to capitalize on those things. If it's not, you know, what got in the way? Why didn't I? What was, what was the blocker that kept me from achieving to do what I just considered a really good job for today? And I think it's been a little bit since I was early on. I was, in, I was in sports and, you know, could I, could I achieve? Could I do better? What could I do? I'm always pushing myself. We kind of joke around here in the office. Monday morning, we have our, our powwow and, you know, although we might have had an epic weekend, it's usually a couple minutes of rah-rah, and then it's like, 
all right, what can we have done better? You know, and I, I like pushing the guys like that and they like it too. We have a real motivated team here. I think that's so important because, you know, we're all working toward perfection. None of us have ever achieved it, you know, or maybe a moment, <laughs> very moment on the, you know, at the winter circle or something like that. But, you know, and this is where, you know, that debrief as entrepreneurs, we have to do this. So, I mean, I encourage everyone, you know, you should do this. It's, it's this is a great life lesson. And let me go one last one that, that really hit me, uh, you know, kind of a, you call it your endurance race mentality. Sure. And uh, what is that and how can the, our fellow, our peers, our entrepreneurs, how can that help them? Sure. If I can pass one lesson from all of the, you know, ups and downs and the highs and lows of the epic events that we've done and some of the crashes and failures over just strictly to the entrepreneurial and business world, that'd be my best one because I call it the endurance racing mentality is, you know, everyone's tempted to always reach for the highs. And I started this because we would look at what's called data. And we look at the data on the racetrack and the drivers would always be seeing where can I go faster? What can I do here better? But if you look at statistically how you win these big events, and I'm equating these big events to just life events, success in small businesses or ventures, it's not usually the highest of high. It's what takes you out in the valley or the peak, avoiding the risks, avoiding the crashes, avoiding the problems. And so if I adopt this philosophy that, look, we've got a good product and we're going to keep pushing, but instead of always trying to go one mile an hour faster as a metaphor. Let's see what's going to take us out here first. There's a stump under the water you didn't see with your speedboat or any other number of things like that. So let's be super careful about those things. And if you're really careful about managing the risk, you're going to succeed at some level. And so it's, it's always a temptation to crawl a little higher, but make sure your ladder is firmly on the ground. And it, it, it is so important. And one of the things that you, I did know, you know, I assumed you did because you're, you're in great shape and so on. But we're, as we're getting prepared for this, we shot some emails back and forth and you mentioned you're heading off for a workout. And, and, you know, this is, I mean, you know, certainly when you were, uh, you know, driving in motorsports, I mean, you, you need, you know, a lot of times people think, well, it's not that much energy to really drive for, you know, a long race. And now it's, just me going around a few times on the track. I, I recognize it's, it's a lot. And, but, you know, I think we sometimes forget the endurance that we, you know, the energy we need for uh, uh, really just being an entrepreneur. How, how does, you know, how has that affected your life and, you know, staying at the top of your game, Kevin? You know, maybe because of early on in sports, a couple little injuries or whatever, but I will tell, you know, one of the best things I would say I could pass along from at least from my perspective is daily some sort of daily physical exercise I'm totally not a uh, an exercise freak um, I do it because it helps me in everything I do it helps me in my attitude it helps me in my you know self awareness and how you feel about yourself it helps you in your appearance and it, you know every day uh, and also I feel I feel blessed in that I'm you know I'm 56 and I don't have any ailments of any kind but I attribute so much of that to daily exercise. It's sort of my religion in terms of being sane and happy. And along with that, I'd say, you know, again, a simple, silly little thing my dad always said is, you know, I get up early. I like getting up early. I get a jump on the day. I always feel like, you know, I get a head start on everyone else if I'm at my desk first and I'm, you know, cranking through emails and then I set my strategy for the day. A lot, I call it a, I call it a yellow pad mentality. It doesn't always work. You know, I, I, I set myself up on the day of what I got to do. Sometimes I look at the yellow pad at five or six o'clock at night. I haven't even touched it yet because there's so much <laughs> other stuff that's coming the way, but at least you have a strategy you're trying to follow. But again, back to that exercise point, I, I, I would just really push, you know, any of the listeners to try just do a little bit, whether it's, you know, and I multitask, so if I'm if I'm walking or if I'm on my bike or whatever, I'm actually on my phone a lot of times, which isn't always so great, but it works for me. So <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, we want everyone that's uh, watching us, listening to us, I mean, we want you to have an unfair competitive advantage. And I think, you know, the last point of that daily physical exercise, I would be one of the first if I could pay a trainer to, to, to go do, you know, 100 crunches, 100 push-ups, and I'd get the end result, I would do it in a second. But you can't. You got to do this, and we've got to have the energy to live the life that we want. And got to make it easy, though, too. You know, I mean, yeah. like I couldn't do it if it had to be a big hassle. So I have a small gym at the at the at the office, or even on the road when I'm at the at the. You know, I'll be on the treadmill. But again, I'll be reading, reading my trade magazines, reading my mail. I got to do two things at once, or I feel like I'm being wasteful. But the exercise for me is as big.
And, and it, it's really, you don't, I mean, you don't need to kill yourself, you know, type thing. And, and I do also like the getting up early in the morning. That's another unfair advantage. You, you know, it's quiet. You can get a lot of things done. You know, let me go. I want to go to a segment here and it's resources. And Kevin, I want to pull up your website. Let's do first uh, TRG. And I, I've got that up. Let me flash it on the screen. Uh, we've got, I mean, You've got some beautiful pictures. Uh, we're gonna we're not gonna have a time to play the sizzle reel. Kevin's got one on experiences that we're gonna link on aesnation.com. Uh, uh, so you know, definitely go. I mean, it's just amazing. But Kevin, tell us a little bit about what are the resources. You know, I can see a lot of people thinking about. You know, this sounds really. You know, I mean, this is on many people's bucket list. I mean, it's on mine. I'm going to take you up on a number of things here. You know, we were kind of kicking around doing. But it's on our bucket list to go. You know, it's one thing to go to a racetrack. It's another to experience it from the driver's perspective. And you do some things to make it really exciting. So, you know, what's on the website and how could they uh, learn more about what you're doing? Sure, appreciate that. You know, what it's morphed into for us is, you know, we're a full service motorsports operation, which offers some great experiential marketing opportunities. We offer some great corporate hospitality. You know, the, I don't think relationship marketing was a word three years ago, but we sure use it and overuse it a lot. So, for instance, you know, we have a big event somewhere around the country. It can be in Florida, it can be out in Raleigh, Durham, it's up in New York. It's a, it's a racing event. Around that, um, we will have an opportunity for people to come as our guest, and it's a you know a, a sort of a equation to maybe sitting in the dugout with the Dodgers or the Yankees. You know, we bring, give them a backstage pass. They come down to the facility, they come down to the racetrack, they get a hot pit credential, they get to mingle with the cars, the drivers. Our sport offers great access. It's one thing that's really nice about it. So there they are with people they've either watched on television or their favorite brand or their favorite, you know. Uh, uh, opportunity there and uh, we also have a very nice setup in our paddock area where we live for those four days so we have a chef or we have a golf cart and we just make the whole thing fun and easy and I think easy is the key because again a lot of people have come to these races and I want you know they think about like it's going to a, a NASCAR race and waiting for two hours to get in with traffic or whatever it's not like that at all and we ran in NASCAR for four years and three years in Sprint Cup enjoyed every minute of it learned a lot but again we've struck a real magic chord here in the sports car world so you know having people come to our events and be part of the weekend and just see it from a backstage pass perspective is wonderful we're doing these motorsports marketing forums around the country right now which are great so this brings in people entrepreneurs you know c-level executives particularly guys looking for new opportunity for their companies to see what it is that we do it's just explaining it in one-on-one terms i'll have a group of our partners there that can tell their experiences with that with us we'll bring industry experts that are involved in the space to explain here's how we activate around our sponsorship and here's how we why we're doing it and uh, you know a variety of uh, announcers and, and those types of things we do that around the country with a series of forums and then the kind of the ultimate thing we've been doing lately are these VIP driving days so we'll go in we're very mobile I have four massive these big massive transporters and the Aston Martin race cars can I can fit on one or two of them we can fit five cars on there so we'll show up at a at a racetrack at a road Atlanta or here at Sonoma or Laguna Seca and set up for the day and um, you know typically um, a company it can be uh, for their corporate executives it can be for their best clients or vendors and we give them an experience like no other to us it, it you know we're being entrusted with someone's relatively large budget for a day event like that and we want to over deliver and want them back and that's been what's happened to us lately is these guys have booking and rebooking and rebooking because they're saying look we have all the stick and ball sports and sky boxes and we've done the golf and we've done the tennis and i just took them out to this racing event and when you let them get in the right seat of the Aston Martin race car with the professional driver, and then they got to drive the car, they've been talking about it for a week, and I just closed a big deal. So, you know, that's why, you know, we're putting those those opportunities together. We do them all over the country, and sometimes by request. Um, we had one last week where someone requested we book a day in their area, and it was a large uh, bank with their wealth management division, and we're working on that. So. Yeah, no, this is, I mean, I've used backstage passes a lot in my businesses to bring connections together and, I, I'll tell you, it, it is amazing, you know, getting that quality time. I didn't know it right in the beginning. You know, I did one of my mentors taught me this and, and uh, it, it's just so valuable. And I, I just want to encourage, you know, whether it's, you know, motorsports or other type of events as entrepreneurs, 
you know, it is relationship marketing is just so important, bringing the right people together. Yep. Absolutely. Look on that. You asked me and I should have mentioned on the website, we actually now offer individual backstage passes to people. It's been very popular. We're doing an event in Austin, Texas at the big Coda, the F1 facility in September. And uh, randomly people are signing up. It's it's a thousand dollar ticket. Uh, but you know what I like about it is when they come, not only do they have a great experience, but they might meet somebody. We have an incredible network, and I love delivering that side, too. I think that's been a big eye-opener for some of these companies when they come. You know, they're involved with us as an annual sponsor, and a lot of times they thought it was going to be around, you know, you know, some sort of social media or, you know, a sticker on the car and stuff for their clients. It's not just that while they're there, they're meeting new clients, they're meeting new heads of companies, and the B2B play in our world has become just massive. You know, when C-level executives meeting C-level executives in, a, in an environment like that, believe me, they're talking and passing business cards back and forth, and everybody's happy, and I'm happy. Ron, Kevin, I, you know, we just met, but uh, I have done events like you're describing in the mortar motorsports world and I can tell you that I've picked up some very large clients through that process and built relationships so that's why I'm so passionate about this let me go let's put up uh, your uh, website on Adobe Road Winery too sure. I, yeah I'm almost hesitant because you, you have such a you know you're, you're such a boutique winery and I love the wine now that I've discovered it and you know I, I'm afraid you're gonna just sell out real quickly here yeah. but talk. you know it's hard it's hard to get a, a bottle but I know a guy John so yeah. <laughs> yeah no and, and and really what are you specialized what's your focus there yeah, so, you know, it's funny because we had plenty of discussions around the uh, boardroom in the old days. Um, you know, we have, a, uh, we have a small group of us involved on the ownership side. I have a dear friend and a partner from Canada that's our, our primary partner right now. And, uh, you know, we, we stayed true to course in that we do craft over 10 different varietals. And it changes from year to year. You know, we're still a big cab house. We do a, a Napa Valley Cabernet and a Sonoma Cabernet, and it used to be, you know, Napa was the king and Sonoma was the little brother. It's the little brother with muscles that you don't pick on anymore because Sonoma is just a beautiful place and just tons of other opportunity around the wine world and other varietals. We're big on our Pinot Noirs, we're big on our Chardonnays, and we craft a lot of little off varietals. We do a, a Viognier, a Semillon, we're doing a Zinfandel, we're doing a blend now, but, uh, you know, a, a Cabernet Franc. And what we're finding is having those small 100, 150 case uh, productions it really excites people, even to sometimes a placement or a restaurant. We cut out most all of our traditional distribution, which was a big decision for us because we got real busy on our direct-to-consumer. So the most uh, way we, we interact and sell wine now is people in our wine club or people that come by the tasting room. And it was a good decision to do that because when you're having to push the distribution model in all the different states, it's time-consuming and expensive. And if you have a good product, you don't need to do that. Although we do have a couple of awesome distributors still out there that we work with. So, you know, I'm really proud of that. We've got over 50% of our business now goes just out of the tasting room and direct-to-consumer. And we stay true to our cause, which was small, boutique, handcrafted. We've got a beautiful facility. It's funny. It's, uh, we have a state-of-the-art. It's a, ware a wine, wine warehouse. We left away from the old Custom Crush co-op model back in 2008, and we built a small uh, state-of-the-art facility that's next door to the race shop here in Petaluma. When people walk into it with all the barrels and the tanks and everything going on, they're like, I didn't know this was here. And you know, Actually, that model is real popular nowadays. Back to what we were saying earlier is, how are we going to take down or compete with the big guys in that world while they're building a you know, testimonial to themselves in a big house on the side of the hill? We're just making good grape juice. And so that's important what goes in no, the bottle. No, you are too. And I, I certainly will be continuing to buy and part of your wine club and encourage others who want to, you know, very specialized boutique with a great story. Let me go to the last segment here, which is takeaways. And I, I took a whole bunch of notes. I've got, uh, and, and, and this is lessons learned. I mean, this is, you know, this is a lot of fun talking about motorsports and wine and all that and entertainment. But there's a, a I'm going to go, there's six big lessons that I walked away. Number one, you know, build a team. Everything's a team. Not, nothing great is accomplished by an individual. Surround yourself with excellent people. You know, don't try to be all things. Recognize, as Kevin did, that he couldn't be the driver if he wanted to be, uh, accomplish all that he wanted to accomplish, even as you know, one of the top drivers in the world. Second, always over deliver. You know, whatever Absolutely. you promise, deliver that and more. And it's going to pay back dividends. Three, 
build your network. Never stop. It's all about connections, relationship marketing. We can have some of the most sophisticated marketing, you know, sending out millions of emails. Oftentimes it's that one connection that is going to be worth more than any other marketing that you're doing. Four, I love the question, did I do an excellent job? Every evening, you know, ask yourself that. What could you have done better? You know, learn life. You know, Kevin, one of the things you, you, I'm so proud of you and, you know, just knowing you and feel very privileged to see how you've let the market kind of guide you along the way. You know, these were bucket lists. This is a direction you wanted to go, but the market told you how to make it work and you listen. So many of us don't listen. The endurance racing uh, mentality, number five. I mean, it is an endurance race. And I think all your fellow entrepreneurs are going to agree with that one right away. But then live it like that. You know, don't get caught up. You know, there's going to be highs and lows, as you talked about. You know, manage the risk. Uh, it is just, you know, it's a great way to live. And then six, you know, have the energy to live. Do that daily physical activity. Make it easy to do. Make Absolutely. it happen. Kevin, you know, this has been great. I want to thank you. I want to encourage all your fellow entrepreneurs to go to AESNation.com. We'll have all the show notes, the links, the transcript of this. Uh, you know, definitely take, if, if you like motorsports, click on the link, examine those bucket lists. If you're a company, you may want to consider creating an event. And I'm going to encourage not too many of you to try the wine because <laughs> it's really good. It's a limited supply. I'll let them try it, Jim. Yeah, no. <laughs> well, and above all, let's go execute. Take these six lessons, make them yours, your clients, your future clients. They're all counting on you. Wish you the best of success. Thank you, John. It's a pleasure and an honor to be on and to share my thoughts with your fellow entrepreneurs. I invite everyone to visit us at any of these events. Come to one of our bucket list events. Come out to the winery. Visit us here in Sonoma. But again, thank you so much. Well, you're very welcome. And I know everyone's excited and you're going to see a good crowd show up. All the best, Kevin. Exceptional, remarkable breakthroughs. AESNation.com.